I'm Dr. Daniel Griffin. And I'm Dixon Dupont. And today we're going to be discussing Denki. Right. So let's start with a little bit of an introduction, the significance. Um, it's estimated that about 400 million dengue infections occur every year. That's incredible. So this is huge. Some, some estimate more dengue infections than malaria infections. The current, the current WHO um, suggestion is twice as many. Really? Huge. Wow. So deng dengue is a huge issue. Um, one of the things I'll say, only about a quarter of these actually result in people being clinically ill. Right. right. So that drops us down to about a million, a hundred million. Right. Okay. But still a pretty, hundred a mere hundred million. <laughs> okay. So another vector-borne infection, it's a mosquito-borne infection. And this time, instead of a protozoan, it's a virus. And there are four different kinds of dengue. So that's maybe why only Zero. one in four yep. gets sick. Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> we'll talk no, about that's, that. Well, that's, we'll, that's a good we'll, lead into we'll, why do you get sick yeah, from dengue. We'll, we'll talk about that. So there are four popularly recognized serotypes of dengue, and a fifth, which I'll say is uh, sort of under discussion, okay. um, was described a number of years back and is still being sorted out. Um, and different serotypes, like dengue type 2, may be more virulent than the other dengue serotypes. Uh, but type 1, type 3, type 4, maybe type 5, we're not sure, um, causes illness. Okay. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the interaction with serotypes. But, but what is clinical disease? What, what is, how does dengue present? Well, one of the terms for it that's commonly bantered about whenever the name comes up is breakbone fever. So maybe you'll lead into that somehow. Actually, no, that, that, is, um, that is one of the classic descriptions. Um, and so in 2009, the WHO um, broke down dengue into two major classifications. So dengue without warning signs and dengue with oh, warning signs. Okay. okay. Um, when it's presenting, it can present with fever, headache, severe bone pain as you're the yeah. break bone f yeah. that you're describing. Yeah. Um, but now there can actually be warning signs. So it's a febrile illness, person feels classic viral syndrome, um, but then there can be what are described as the warning signs. And so we'll go through what the warning signs are. Sure. Um, and I'm gonna, we're gonna start off with, we're actually going very quickly from clinical disease into the diagnosis because <laughs> the clinical disease and the symptoms lead you to the, lead you to the diagnosis. Cool. Um, so the WHO has come up with a very helpful um, dengue definition. Okay. Um, and they have a probable dengue and a confirmed dengue. Uh -huh. Okay, and then we're going to talk about the dengue being into the, the severe or the with or without warning signs. Okay. So probable dengue is a febrile illness with two or more of the following criteria. So criteria would be headache, retroorbital or pain behind the eyes, myalgias, arthralgia, rash, hemorrhagic manifestations. Mm. That's gonna get us to talk about the tourniquet test. That's right. Leukopenia, so these are white cells below a certain level, and serologies that are supportive but not confirmatory. Got it. And our confirmed dengue is gonna be we isolate the virus. Right. We have a greater than or equal to fourfold rise in the IgG or IgM. So we're gonna need paired sera. We're gonna need sera right now when the person's sick. And we're gonna need convalescent sera. A little bit of a challenge in some contexts. Also. Um, a positive dengue virus antigen test. So there are rapid antigen tests. Oh, that's good. Which are great when you have access to them. If you're in a dengue endemic region, sure. something you should think of. and have in your, in your, your kit, right. um, or a positive nucleic acid amplification test. Right, so we already talked about one organism that causes fever that when they come in, you have to distinguish that fever from all the other fevers. This also presents with fever it's when true. you first come in. So now you're stuck with these two overlapping diseases mm -hmm. and you've got to distinguish rapidly because the treatments for each of these is quite different. It's interesting. The, um, 
there isn't a lot of treatment for dengue, actually. It's huh. almost an avoid, avoidance of certain treatments. Okay. Um, and so, yes, and in a lot of areas, there can be an overlap. And so that's what it's super helpful to have diagnostic tests, the ability to distinguish malaria, for instance, from dengue or dengue from many other viral diseases. Doesn't the fever from dengue last continuously? So that that would be a distinguishing feature that would... So as we discussed early on in malaria, they may not have reached the same nice. periodicity. So it's and not so simple. you may be seeing fever. It's not simple. <laughs> it's not simple. It's not simple. Um, and some of the things like the dropping white cells. So we've got our blood test. You might see that with malaria you as might. well. So it's not always an easy distinction. Um, headache, fever, all the things that we're describing could be malaria. And I, I think I mentioned malaria until proven otherwise. You Maybe bet. what about dengue until proven otherwise? Right. Um, because dengue is responsible for a significant number of deaths. It's not a uh, non-infection without consequence. That's correct. Um, so one of the things to think about if you're in, in, in certain regions, um, I know there's a there's a dengue season in Thailand and Vietnam yeah. where the hospital is actually overflowing with dengue cases. Exactly. But since it's mosquito borne, it's going to be the same time of year potentially as your mosquito other mosquito borne. Oh, uh, that that's a very interesting distinction, though, right? right? Because malaria is transmitted by the Anopheles mosquito only, whereas this infection is transmitted by the other mosquitoes and. Right. Let's make a distinction about the fact that the Anopheles female mosquito is biting at night. Yes, Deng mostly. The dengue um, mosquitoes tend to be, I love this word, crepuscular mosquitoes. <laughs> they tend to bite at <laughs> dawn right. and dusk. That's right. So class, classically, you can see this with the, the tiger mosquito, right? The Asian tiger mosquito. Aedes albopictus. And the Aedes albopictus, but also Aedes aegypti can yes. transmit as well. Yes. But albopictus is probably the most efficient. Right. Um, it will actually bite you in the morning. It'll bite you in the evening, not just <laughs> nighttime when you might be out and about and not under your bed nets. Right. So uh, this, this could be quite an issue that way. Um, one of the things that we, we want to make sure we get to while we're talking about hemorrhagic manifestations. They used to talk about dengue and hemorrhagic dengue. And when you have severe dengue, one of the aspects associated with mortality can be bleeding manifestations. So there, there's a test that was sort of in vogue, out of vogue, back in vogue, called the tourniquet test. Huh. And um, this is, you know, for a while there, I was going to say it was like the string test for uh, one of our parasitic diseases. <laughs> right. But, uh, but so this is also called the rumple lead capillary fragility test. I had to read that because that is hard to remember. <laughs> um, but what you actually do is you, you take a blood pressure cuff and you, you measure the blood pressure. So you have systolic and diastolic. You find that midway point between the two and you inflate the cuff to the midway point and leave it on for five minutes. Huh. This is uncomfortable. People do not like this. I can imagine. At the end of the five minutes, you wait two minutes and you measure a square, a one inch by one inch square, and you count the number of little petechiae oh, that you have, adu that you have oh. induced. And if it's greater than 10, that would be considered a positive tourniquet test. It's very practical. Yeah, and it's actually quite characteristic um, and is considered one of the hemorrhagic manifestations in wow. addition to gum bleeding and, and other things that you might um, right. see with, with the hemorrhagic manifestations in dengue. Exactly. Uh, let's talk a little bit about stages because this will help how people present. Um, the first stage is the febrile stage. They wow. come in, they've got the fever, they've got the headache, they've got the associated symptoms. Right. They don't have the rash. The fever goes away, the next day the rash appears. Oh. And the rash is just typically described as white islands in a sea of red. <laughs> it is a classic rash, very recognizable if you've seen it. Sure. And you'll see it diffuse, particularly on the torso, it'll be down on the limbs, oh. and it'll be almost a confluent red with all these little white islands. Goodness. But the timing, the viremia has ended 
And now what you're actually starting to see is the immune response. And this is when you're starting to get into the second stage. Actually, this is the critical stage. Most people do okay during the first stage with the viremia. It's the second stage when you can see shock and hemorrhagic complications. Interesting. So this has actually presented a problem because people would often be admitted. And now I think we've talked, your fever has broken. Good. We now know it's all gonna be okay. Yeah. But with dengue, this is when, this is when you start to worry. This is when the patient may develop shock, may develop dengue with complications. Um, and let's talk about what those complications might be and why. And early on, you brought up a number of serotypes of dengue. Yep. So it's your first time, healthy individual, middle of life. You got a dengue serotype three infection, probably going to be just fine. Now you go to a different part of the world where they have serotype two and you get your second case of dengue infection. Ordinarily, your immune system is prepared for it. Well, it might not recognize type 2. Right, you think maybe type 2 will be a little milder. It might cross-react enough to allow some protection, but that's not what happens, is it? So here, you have what they call an antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Oh, right. So those antibodies that you produce from type 3 actually augment and magnify the immune response. Yeah, dear. Because think about when you're getting into trouble with dengue, the virus is already cleared, it's the immune response. And an over exuberant immune response right. can lead to the manifestation. So right. classically, the shock or the dengue with warning signs is developing either in individuals who are getting a second infection with a different, different type of dengue, different right. serotype, right. or in young children. And young children might get severe or dengue with warning signs first infection. So this complicates a long-term control strategy, that is the development of a vaccine. I know you probably we don't have time for it here, but... No, no, actually, I think it's critical. Okay. Okay. Because if you vaccinate someone against any one of these serotypes, and they're totally immune to it, and then they encounter another serotype, you're going to get this kind of reaction. And that's and the so that, exact yeah. opposite of what you want. Yeah, so that's always been the challenge and is the challenge. Um, there is uh, There are dengue vaccine trials going on right now. Exactly. And one of the concerns has always been that if you don't get protection against all the serotypes, right. you may end up potentially getting that's one right. of that's the right. serotypes right. and that your, what you thought of as protection sure. may be magnifying the immune response against right. that missed serotype. Indeed. Indeed. Nature. Um, it's, we have to deal with it. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you survive the critical phase, then you go on to what we call phase three or the convalescent phase. Okay. And most people go on to have a full recovery. Oh, that's good. Some of the people who've had hemorrhagic complications may not go on to a full recovery, um, but that's normally the acute, so stage one. Two, which is fever's gone, rash occurs, this is the critical stage. Right. And then three, when we have convalescent stage. Right. Um, we, we talked about diagnosis that was sort of tied up sure. right in with our clinical presentation. Um, but let's talk about treatment. How do we treat these people? But you already I said there's no this. treatment. Come on, <laughs> I'm going to quote you now. There's no treatment. That is it. So what do we, so what do we tell them? <laughs> You're going to get better if you get past that uh, uh, second stage, which is critical. So the, um, so the big thing is, is don't do the wrong thing. Right. And the wrong thing, if you're worried about someone with potentially hemorrhagic complications, you don't want to give them anything that might interfere with platelet function. Like so aspirin. No aspirin. <laughs> That's right. No, um, no ibuprofen. Oh, no naproxen. No non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. No, no medicines that might encourage hemorrhagic complications. Right. Which, you know, they've got fever. Exactly. And so you need to be very careful about treating the fever with cooling towels, with mechanical okay. means, with maybe paracetamol or acetaminophen, uh, but avoiding anything that might um, cause hemorrhagic complications because platelets will often drop quite low, below 20,000. Um, IV fluids in severe cases, so all the supportive measures that you wanna be thinking about. 
So worry about volume. And then it's very difficult. They've, there are no large scale, well controlled therapeutic trials of any agents. And there isn't even a great well controlled trial that helps you determine who should and shouldn't be admitted. Wow. Because you think it's, it's quite odd. They're, they're all better. The fever's gone, the symptoms right. are improving. Right, right. And this is when they may end up with the complications that are life threatening. Dear, dear. So we fill our hospitals with all the febrile, miserable people who are not yet at the high risk period. Got it. Dear. So it's a challenge. Big one. A good friend of mine, Scott Halstead, spent his entire life working on dengue and, and worked for the Rockefeller Foundation for many, many years. And I often met him at this tropical medicine meeting that I often went to. And every time he started to talk about his favorite subject, he started to throw up his hands and said, I don't know where we're at right now. It's, it's a very difficult thing to know, except he knows it's getting worse. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think he would say anything different now than he would then. Yeah. I mean, we've had some positive things, and I think that when we, when we distribute our mosquito nets because we're focused on malaria, <clears throat> that can have some benefits, bit, yeah. but again, the timing is an issue. And I guess the, the last thing to point out, so we have our um, dengue without warning signs, our dengue with warning signs, and then of our dengue with warning signs, we have our severe dengue. Yeah. And these are the people that we're worried about severe bleeding, severe plasma leak, so we have problems maintaining intravascular volume. Exactly. Um, we might see our um, transaminases, our AST and ALT, greater than a thousand fold. We start to see impaired consciousness, ultimately we can organ failure and death. The majority of the deaths due to dengue are in children. All right, well, thank you for joining us for our talk today about dengue, which is a yep. tremendous problem throughout the world. Yeah, we'll be back.